Over the last few weeks, we've been traveling along with Jesus on the road. Uh, we've entitled this series On the Road and have been visiting different places. Thank you to everybody who's taken us along with them on their family vacations. What a great way to connect with you as you're traveling uh, throughout the country and around the world as we've, uh, Flat Adam and Flat Jared have been to Israel, we've been to Spain, we've been all over the place. And so uh, Nova Scotia, we, we've just had a great summer already. Love to visit all those places in real life, but you know, the flat version will do for right now. Well, I'll invite you to stand as we experience our scripture reading this morning, Luke chapter 8, verses 26 through 39, as we again travel on the road with Jesus. Hear this word. Then they arrived at the country of the Gerasenes, which is opposite Galilee. As he stepped out on land, a man of the city who had demons met him. For a long time he had worn no clothes, and he did not live in a house, but in the tombs. When he saw Jesus, he fell down before him. And shouted at the top of his voice, What have you to do with me, Jesus, Son of the Most High God? I beg you, do not torment me. For Jesus had commanded the unclean spirit to come out of the man. For many times it had seized him. He was kept under guard and bound with chains and shackles, but he would break the bonds and be driven by the demon into the wilds. Jesus then asked him, What is your name? And he said, Legion. For many demons had entered him. And they begged him not to order them to go back into the abyss. Now there, on the hillside, a large herd of swine was feeding, and the demons begged Jesus to let them enter these. So he gave them permission. Then the demons came out of the man and entered the swine, and the herd rushed down the steep bank into the lake and was drowned. When the swine herders saw what had happened, they ran off and told it in the city and in the country. Then people came out to see what had happened. And when they came to Jesus, they found the man from whom the demons had gone sitting at the feet of Jesus, clothed and in his right mind, and they were afraid. Those who had seen it told, told them how it was that he had, the demon-possessed man, the demon, I'm sorry, by demons, had been healed. Then all the people of the surrounding country of the Gerasenes asked Jesus to leave them, for they were seized with great fear. So he got into the boat and returned. The man from whom the demons had gone begged that he might be with him. But Jesus sent him away, saying, Return to your home and declare how much God has done for you. So he went away, proclaiming throughout the city how much Jesus had done for him. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. You may be seated. And as you're seated, I'll invite you to pray with me this morning. Gracious God, as we open your word, we pray that you would open our hearts, that we might follow you more fully, that we might be whole people through your son, Jesus. Pray this in his name. Amen. Well, as we've been journeying along together on the road, we've been asking you where Jared and I should go and visit. And so uh, we've been to a few different places, and this morning is no different. Uh, I apologize in advance. The sound is a little bad because it was a windy day uh, in Athens, Georgia, as Jared and I got to go and visit Sanford Stadium. Check this out. Hey there, Lawrenceville First. We are on our road trip, uh, yet another destination that you recommended, uh, Adam and Jared here, and we are at Sanford Stadium, between the hedges, between the hedges. It, it really worked out well for us. You guys recommended that we come here. Uh, we happen to be in Athens for annual conference. Here since 1911, they moved from the old spot so they could rival another team here in Georgia. That we'll go with <laughs> Main team. Now I know I wore red today because we're coming here. I I have no SEC allegiance at all, and so I, you know, the whole Georgia. I didn't think we were supposed to say that. I don't either. There, it's out there. Yeah. There, it's out there. It's out there. Uh, I did go to a, a red and black school though, so I do have some red and black. Uh, I'll tell you that story another time. But I, I do love watching football games uh, Saturday, Sunday. I love seeing the fans. It's crazy to see how people kind of 
get into the game. I, I don't know about you, but I found myself yelling at the TV a time or two. How about yep. you? Even if I don't care for the team, yeah, absolutely. I will get pretty riled up. Like a man possessed. All right, Lawrenceville first. Hope you enjoyed your road trip today. Thanks for coming with us. It was convenient to be in Athens for annual conference, so we just had to go around the corner to Sanford Stadium, and uh, like you heard me say, I unfortunately have no SEC allegiances, so please don't judge me harshly, like, or, or ACC for that matter. Uh, I cheer for the Big South, where Gardner-Webb firmly rests at the bottom of the table. But it has been enjoyable to go on these road trips and to go different places. Uh, it's interesting what happens to people sometimes on road trips. Uh, if you put a, a family, a, a perfectly functional family, well-adjusted, you put them in a car for a certain number of hours, and it's amazing the things that you discover about them. Uh, Jen Hatmaker, a, a popular author, uh, describes four phases of any family road trip. And she describes them in this way. I think they're very accurate. She says the, fir the first phase is uh, patient optimism. Patient optimism. At the beginning of the road trip, you, you say, this is going to be great. We're going to have such a good time together. This is going to be such wonderful family bonding. Eight hours in the car with our whole family. What could be better? We're going to play games. We're going to count uh, trees. We're going to look at license plates and, and see how many of the 50 states we can find. We're going to play the alphabet game. This is going to be great. And then you leave the driveway. <laughs> and you move into the second phase of any family road trip, which is irritated intervention. You know, it's when the kids start to get at one another, they start to, you know, fuss and fight a little bit, they start to ask you, how much longer? And you say things like, until we get there, or I've just started telling my kids an hour, like, how much longer? An hour. You said that six hours ago. Could be an hour. You can hope. You start saying just, just the strangest things, you know, the kids will be fussing and fighting, and you say, oh, kids, let's just get along, let's, let's try to find some common ground, and then as you move further through irritated intervention, you start saying things like, okay, there's an imaginary wall in between you, do not cross the imaginary wall. Don't reach into your brother's space. Don't reach into your sister's space. Do not breathe the same air. As the trip continues, you move into the third phase, which is the terrifying serial killer phase. <laughs> this is that moment where you are somehow outside of yourself and you say things that you would never say in real life. Your kids keep yelling, Dad, Dad, Dad. And you say, if you say Dad one more time, so help me, I will throw myself from this moving car. <laughs> In fact, there is no more Dad. You may call me Adam, and only Adam. <laughs> the last phase is called quiet acceptance, where you realize your family is crazy. And you just need to accept it. We were driving to Baltimore from Augusta two years ago, Michelle and I and our kids. And it was, it was a, a while into the trip, we went through Washington, D.C., where there's lots of roads and they go lots of different directions and not all of them make sense. And I had been through many of the phases during this trip. And, and at this moment of quiet acceptance... I remember the kids were arguing, Michelle was looking at me, and I just reached down and grabbed my earbuds for my iPhone, put them in, and looked at Michelle, who was like, don't you dare. <laughs> Play. And I was in my own world. <laughs> Quiet acceptance. <laughs> it's funny. It's funny what happens to us on road trips. I, I'm, uh, I'm serious. If, if, if you took a camera crew along with us on our road trip, you would think 
that we had multiple personalities. You would think that we were possessed by demons at points along our road trip, that we move through these different phases, we move through these different experiences, we move through these different uh, reactions in such a way that you would say, wow, that guy's not right. And before you go judging me, if you had a camera crew in your car, they'd say the same thing about you. It's amazing what happens. So as we read this story of the Gerasian demoniac, I want you to, to suspend some of those thoughts that you immediately go to. And hear again this story as it might relate to us here and now in this moment, as we might experience some of that same sort of fragmentation, some of that same sort of struggle, some of that same sort of hurt, some of that same sort of anger and outburst that we see from this man who had been shackled and chained. It's fascinating to see him because he, he's off to himself. He lives among the tombs, but as Jesus steps off of the boat on this, this trip across the sea, he meets him there. But here are his words. Go away from me, son of the most high God. Don't torment me. I think many of us live our lives in such a way that we have these struggles and hurts and pains inside of us that we wrestle with day in and day out. And we think in some way or another, they disqualify us or they push Jesus away. I had a friend who was in the army, who was in special forces, did lots of things that he didn't want to talk about. And he would tell me all the time, I don't think that Jesus can love me because of the things that I've done. And he would push Jesus away. Jesus, don't come too close. And it's fascinating to me that throughout Scripture, the people, the very people that think we think Jesus would back away from are the people that Jesus tends to step towards. He steps out of the boat towards this man who has all of these demons, who can't be restrained, who shouts wildly, who's full of rage. And Jesus steps towards this man in the same way that he steps towards each and every one of us. Jesus invites us to come close and and to talk about some of that stuff that we've got going on. Some of those places in our lives that we don't talk about at parties, but somehow or another, if you put us in a stressful situation, seem to bubble up to the top. A couple of years ago, we were going somewhere in the car, and, and you know, we only had Caleb and Sayla at that point. Micah wasn't along for the ride yet, and Caleb had done something that just set me off, just beyond what is normal and, and under control. Like I, I had this almost out-of-body experience where I saw myself getting angry, and I couldn't stop it. I was just so very angry. And I stayed angry, and I stayed angry, and I stayed angry. And Michelle finally said to me, she said, what is your problem? You don't realize what it's like to be on the other side of you, do you? Because here's what happens, is is most of us have some places in our lives, some brokenness, some hurt, some struggles, some addictions, some problems. And what we do is we layer things on top of them to try to keep everybody else from seeing them. We, we go and we live in the tombs away from everybody else because if we had to engage people on a day in and day out basis, they might see some of that stuff. We hide from God, we hide from people, and, and every once in a while when, we, when the circumstances are just right, all of that stuff explodes. We become shattered into this pieces of our true selves. And Jesus comes along, invites us to engage in a different way. He steps into the messiness 
of that. And for each of us, there's different reasons for that. There's different struggles. There's different things there. And, and some of us might need more help to get to the bottom of some of those things that we've covered up for years. I had to go and see a, a Christian counselor. I had to go and sit with somebody and talk about what was going on and what was making me so angry. And, and what I found out is that, that I still had all this anger towards my dad. And the anger towards my dad was making me act angry towards my kids because there was some sort of fear that I was going to be just like my dad. And so why not push the kids away? Why not keep them at arm's reach? This terrible cycle of hurt and pain. And so many of us have been in similar places. So many of us have experienced similar things. Before we go and throw the demon-possessed man under the bus, let's look in the rearview mirror for a moment. Jesus is amazing and graceful and loving. And so it doesn't leave us where we are. In fact, Jesus has this conversation, this strange conversation with this demon-possessed man. says, what's your name? The demon-possessed man says, Legion, because there's so many of me. I'm so fragmented. I don't even know who I am anymore because I've been hiding all of these things for all of these years. And there's some pigs sitting on a hill nearby. And the demons say, Jesus, don't send us into the abyss. Send us into the pigs. So Jesus obliges, says, okay, demons, you can go into the pigs, whatever you want. They're, they're... Go into the pigs. It's where we get the term deviled ham. <laughs> Come on, that's good. That's really good. <laughs> if you didn't like that one, you're not going to like this next one. <laughs> and the pigs run off the cliff and are drowned in the water, which is where the original Bay of Pigs invasion happened. That one is good, too. I like you, you guys. You don't love the dad jokes. And there the man sits in front of Jesus, fully clothed and in his right mind. And the people run away and, and tell everybody what had happened. And they come back and they see him and and the word they use is that he's healed. It's this great Greek word, this word sozo. And, and what sozo means is wholeness. He's healed. He's whole. He's put back together. And sitting in front of Jesus in his right mind, in himself, of himself, knowing himself because he's been known by Jesus. It's the same word that in the Old Testament we use, shalom, a sense of peace and wholeness with God and with those around. And what's so interesting is that as the people gather, they see this man who's been healed, this, this guy who they've been scared of, this guy who they've talked about at all their dinner parties, this guy who they've said time and time again, well, at least my life's not as bad as that guy's. At least I've got it together more than the dude who lives in the tombs and scares everybody. All of a sudden, he's healed and whole, and they're scared. Who will we deflect to? What if Jesus wants to talk to me about my stuff? That's scary. And so they say, Jesus, go away from us. We don't want to have that conversation. We don't want to talk about our stuff. We'd rather talk about his stuff because his stuff is worse than our stuff. And as long as his stuff is worse than our stuff, we're good, right? It's just another layer that we put on. Jesus wants to take a step towards us and Jesus wants to invite us to experience the same thing that that demon-possessed man experienced, a sense of wholeness being put back together In the midst of our 
ugliest moments, Jesus steps towards us. In the midst of our anger and frustration, Jesus steps toward us. I'm convinced that there is this underlying current of anger in our culture. It was just sitting there, boiling under so many people. You can just see it. You can see it in the way people engage one another and the way people talk to one another and the way people post on the internet about one another. You can see it in our popular culture. You can see it in movies. Uh, One of my favorite movies is a movie called Fight Club. Don't go see it. It's rated R. It's bad. You wouldn't like it. Lots of naughty language. There's this quote in Fight Club that I, I really like and I think describes some of that anger, some of that frustration that we live with, some of that stuff that we don't want to deal with. Tyler Durden, the main character, says, We're the middle children of history. We have no purpose or place. We have no great war, no great depression. Our great war, it turns out, is a spiritual war. Our great depression is our lives. We've been all raised by television to believe that one day we'd be millionaires and movie gods and rock stars. But we won't. And we're slowly learning this fact. And we're very, very ticked off. We struggle with this anger and this need for purpose. See, when we're whole and we're put together, the thing that keeps us from going back to that graveyard, going back to that place of death, going back to that place of brokenness is a sense of purpose and hope for the future. And that's exactly what Jesus gives this man. Even though everybody says, leave Jesus, we don't want to deal with our stuff, go away Jesus, Jesus turns his attention back to the demon-possessed man. The demon-possessed man who says, Jesus, I want to go with you. But Jesus gives him a bigger and a better purpose than just following him. He says, I want you to go and to return to your home and declare how much God has done for you. Men, can I talk to you for just a moment? Ladies, you can listen in. This this may be you too. But what would it look like if we returned home And instead of covering up some of those places that we struggle with, instead of saying, you know, I'm just going to watch TV or I'm just going to go and do this or uh, whatever we cover it up with because we all have something that we cover it up with. What if we were just honest about our struggles? What if we were honest about what God is doing in our lives? What if we said, this is what I'm wrestling with and this is what God is teaching me? What our homes look like? If we could just be open enough to overcome that fear. See, this is what God is doing. I think it has the power to transform our homes and our families and our community. If we were bold and brave enough to harness our purpose that Jesus gives us in this moment, to go home and declare how much God has done for us. What a purpose. What a way to live. Honest, integrated, whole. Saved and put back together by the grace of God and invited to share that good news with everyone we come in contact with. If we stopped puffing up, if we stopped pretending, if we stopped allowing all of the things that are untrue in our lives to make us angry. If we let go of those things and asked Jesus to make us whole, sozo. 
and then return to our homes to share that good news. What God could do in our midst. Maybe you're here this morning and you've felt shattered by so many things in your life. Maybe you're here this morning and you sense that anger just below the surface. Maybe you're here this morning and and you just struggle on this day, on Father's Day, because of so many reasons. Maybe today is a day to spend a few moments at this place asking Jesus to take another step closer and to invite you to wholeness and healing so that you can have a bigger purpose and return home sharing all that God is doing in your life. Will you pray with me? Gracious God, we know that in this moment we're scared. We're scared because it's difficult for us to be honest about our brokenness, our hurt, our anger, our pain. It's difficult to be honest about the fact that we feel like we've never measured up, or that we've never done what we feel like we should have done. God, help us in this moment to see ourselves as you see us, as you step toward us because you love us and want us to live put back together, whole. And with purpose. God, we long for the wholeness found in you. God, maybe this morning we need to take some brave steps to talk to someone else to experience that wholeness. God, give us courage to do just that. We pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen.